I'm selling a cat. That's when our voices start to change. Hello, I'm Scott Lambert. It was a crazy mosaic of laughter and tears, of celebrations and demonstrations, of triumphs and tragedies. It was a year in the life of Australia. In 1988, our country turned 200, and there were some wonderful celebrations. And many of the people who made the news had reason to celebrate too. Our entertainers in particular. John Farnham captured the hearts of huge audiences and was proclaimed Australian of the Year. Kylie Minogue went from local television actor to international singing star in the most spectacular rise in the history of pop music. And then there was Paul Hogan, who secured his place as a major star of the movie industry. In the process, Hogue's helped put Australia on the map. Croc 2 knocked him flat. It opened to a torrent of publicity and went straight to the top at the box office. The US opening was a star-studded event. And although Paul Hogan arrived with his wife and Linda Kozlowski under separate cover, the rumors had already begun that theirs was more than just an on-screen romance. Paul Hogan returned to Australia a national hero, and the press were keen to know whether success had changed him. It's funny when I read, you know, Oh, as late as yesterday or the day before, I'm not the same happy-go-lucky rigger. Well, I should hope not. <laughs> I can't After a shock illness in 87, Hogan claimed to be fighting fit again. I smoke and I drink and um, I don't have stress and I'm healthy. Huge crowds turned out at the Sydney premiere and the moviegoers loved the show. Morris, it's fabulous. I mean, it, I think it's... As good, if not better, than the original. Fantastic. Excited. Good. Great movie. I thought the film was great. Are Paul and Linda a perfect match? I'd say they look pretty good together. They've got a compatibility. Well, I'd have to talk to Dexter, actually, for that one. And that was still the question that remained on everyone's lips. Was there a real-life romance between the stars? Dexter, I'm check on Paul. Do you know where they are? The world's press took up the story and had a field day. And eventually, Hoag's and Linda, who were outraged by the scandal-mongering, were forced to break their silence. My wife and I are separated, and I'm now with Linda Kozlowski, and that's the sort of full story. Uh, how, when, where, why, and all these sort of intimate details. Um, no one needs to know any of that. Well, I mean, you Very know, sure. that's not for this personal. I mean, uh, I don't talk to my best friends and my mom about my personal life. I'm not much of an Errol Flynn, really. I mean, one wife in 30 years, and that one lover. Um, it's sort of not very, uh, it's not the thing that Mickey Rooney and Jar Jar Gabor never made of, really. <laughs> in an effort to escape the glare of publicity, Paul and Linda bought a shack on the beach. Admittedly, on Malibu Beach, a shack like this one goes for around $2 million. Olivia Newton-John is just up the road, and Larry Hagman has a beach house not far away. In 88, Paul Hogan became a Hollywood superstar, but he clearly wasn't pleased by the loss of privacy that goes with it. No one would say it's a world-shattering song, but this single entered the British pop charts at number two, the fastest selling debut record from a female artist in that country's history. Not long after, it was released in the US with predictions of equally great things. Here was a rise to stardom the like of which the world hadn't seen in a long time. Kylie Minogue, as they say in the industry, was hot. Suddenly, the 20-year-old from Melbourne was feeling the blinding glare of the world media. But somehow, she seemed to manage to keep her feet planted firmly on the ground. In fact, many critics suggested that her staggering success was due, at least in part, 
to the fact that she seemed just like an ordinary um, person. I don't think I'll ever comprehend the enormity of it. It's, um, as you say, England, it, it's opened up a whole new avenue. And now uh, there's all of Europe and I'm in the American charts. So, I mean, I, just the other day I sat down and I was listening to my album, it's just complete. And I was thinking, gosh, when I was about 10, you know, dancing around with a hairbrush in the lounge room, having your own ABBA concerts, I would never, ever in my wildest dreams have imagined that I'd be making world-class music myself. That will probably apply to almost everything Kylie tries to do privately in the future. A lot of your private life is taken away from you. You try to keep, I especially try to keep my family private. Although there was pictures of my mother when she was 16 in a, On page one a magazine the other day. <laughs> and um, that's a little bit disconcerting. You think, oh dear, what else do they know? But um, you get used to it and I've become a lot more business wise and a bit more assertive and responsible, but not, not as I've always been. I'm still myself. It only remains to be seen whether Kylie Minogue's success in 88 was a radiant flash in the pan or the beginning of a fabulous career. It was at a garden party at Sydney's Kirribilli House that the Prime Minister declared John Farnham the Australian of the Year. In an emotional response, Farnham talked of his vision for our country. Look at our collective backyard, because if we despoil what we have, we can't just move next door. We can't find another paddock to build a house on. So, Australia does deserve national pride. We are right. Hang on. We are right to instill national pride in our children. But please, let's make our national pride encompass humanity. Thank you very much. Well, I think we should clear our act up a little bit. Uh, actually, a lot. But I, you know, I, I can't get into the deep, dark politics of it or, or make any, any prophecies or, or anything like that. Ultimately, all I am is a singer, and I can make the comments that I make with the lyrics that I, I, I can use in, in songs and hopefully capture someone's imagination and make them think about it. Amazing year. I didn't think after the baby arriving and everything being so great this year that, that anything could, could get better, but uh, I, I, it's been amazing. One of the greatest swimmers of all time, Australia's Dawn Fraser, took on a new challenge in 88. After a tough fight at the polls, she held her first news conference as a member of the New South Wales Parliament at the Dawn Fraser Swimming Pool in the Sydney suburb of Balmain. Well, I'm extremely excited, uh, I'm ecstatic and I'm very, very nervous. 
And it was like going back to college yesterday, walking in the Parliament House and then being ushered into a seat. And uh, it's a mighty challenge, and I think it's possibly the biggest challenge I've ever had in my life, and I know that I can do it. That's it. Adam and the Cobra has won the lady singles at Kuyong. 1988 saw the 25-year-old Czechoslovakian tennis queen, Hanna Mandlikova, become one of our newest Aussies in a ceremony at the Rocks. And still, we couldn't get her name right. I always felt like home here, and always the people are very nice, and it's always nice weather, and, and uh, I felt like home here, so I'm, I'm glad i become Australian. She is known as the body, and it's not hard to see why. When Elle McPherson appeared on the cover of America's Sports Illustrated magazine, she shocked to stardom. Shortly after, Elle was voted among the ten most beautiful women in the world. Elle came back down under in our bicentennial year to make a series of commercials to help promote her hometown of Sydney. I, I really feel very proud promoting Sydney, especially at the moment, because it's, it's such a wonderful place to be. The world-class model is revelling in her international success, but she does admit that she still gets first-night nerves before a big parade. Oh, ah! <laughs> No, they're probably going to go, oh, look at her, she can't walk. <laughs> In fact, Dell was getting it all right this year. Little wonder that the media just wouldn't leave her alone. Are you still here? You know, make them very emotional. And a new Australian beauty was born to Jill and it's Neville the most Rann. It's exquisite kind of happiness. Harriet is their first child. At 61, the former New South Wales Premier and President of the Australian Labor Party has two children from a former marriage. But for Jill, at 39, Harriet is number one. We're very lucky. I think she's going to be a politician. <laughs> the Hanging Out the Dirty Washing Award of 1988 definitely went to Sir Frank and Lady Renouf. He was the New Zealand multimillionaire, 25 years her senior. She, the ex-Mrs. Andrew Peacock, the ex-Mrs. Robert Sangster. When Frank Renouf married Susan Sangster in 1986, the bride declared her new husband had bought her Point Piper mansion from husband number two for love of her. Frank Renouf, it seemed, was the Oxford-educated millionaire who could keep Susan in the style she was accustomed to. But the stock market crash of 87 hit Sir Frank hard. And the business slump was accompanied by personal disaster. Soon, the Renouf divorce case was a messy and bitter front-page saga. Ladies and gentlemen, let me apologize... At first, Susan left Sydney for her country retreat at Mittagong. But when she returned to comfort her bereft husband, the media smelt a scandal and put the Harbourside mansion under siege. And Sir Frank let them know that he wasn't particularly glad to see his estranged wife. She came here under compassion. She was not here. She ought to go. She's very happy down at Mittagong. So you'd like Can't to you leave and go to Mitigong? Oh, I have. <laughs> and what was the reply? She doesn't want to go. She wants to make my life intolerable. Sir Frank invited the media in to watch him hit a ball. Susan took advantage of that to play her own game. Who's the prisoner now? Somebody's locked the door. 30 all. She's, she's indulging in fantasy, that's all. If I move the other side, she walks around the other side. And if I go outside that side, she comes out and has a look. And if I come to this side, she has a look. And if I go in through that door, she rushes in and puts the bolts on it. Then the shock announcement of the week. True love had prevailed. I'd like you uh, all to know that my wife and I are happily reunited. Thank you. And all our differences have been resolved. 
So it was cocktail parties as usual at Paradis Sumir. And the media were no longer required. All I'm saying to you, please go away. You know, isn't that the end of it? Please. In fact, the end of it came a few weeks later. And Paradis Sumer was sold for a record undisclosed price. Well, the lives of the rich and famous, eh? But while the Renoufs no doubt suffered considerable embarrassment, many ordinary folk fared very much worse. Great floods devastated vast areas of our country in 1988, leaving thousands homeless. Australia is no doubt a land of droughts and flooding rains, but this year the weather was particularly cruel. In fact, we witnessed the first reliable signs that weather patterns are changing, with one record after another being broken, adding credibility to the frightening theories of the greenhouse effect and the breakdown of the ozone layer. They're not the kind of scenes you usually associate with the stretch of desert between Alice Springs and Ayers Rock. But in 88, weather patterns were turned upside down. The Fink River became a swirling sea of flood water. And even the Todd was dangerously high. One Aboriginal woman went missing and was believed drowned. Brisbane fared little better, with millions of dollars damage done and many left homeless. But Sydney was the worst hit, with one flood after another. The rains just didn't stop, sending many produce growers into ruin. April was the wettest month in recorded history. And that wasn't the end of it. Residents of Mona Vale on Sydney's northern beaches thought they were seeing things when a freak hailstorm left their suburb looking like a snowfield. <laughs> and in May, more rain sending western suburbs underwater again. The long, hot summer became the big wet. While the water's running, it's going somewhere. When you can't hear it, that's when it's just backing up. And that's when it comes to get you. And the winter that followed was hot, breaking even more records. Well, yes, today was officially the last day of winter. Mind you, it could just as easily have been the middle of summer. But contemplate this, if you will, seriously. I understand that this is the second consecutive warmest winter on record. The greenhouse effect starting to bite? Well, that aside, today was delightful in Sydney. We had a top of 21... The greenhouse effect. The warming of our planet due to an excess of carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. 1988 was the year that people started taking this theory seriously. The Australian Alps had one of its worst seasons on record, and the question was asked, would we have a ski industry in the future? But if the greenhouse effect does bite, that will be the least of our problems. And then there's the breakdown of the ozone layer, a protective barrier lying 35 kilometres above the Earth, which helps filter damaging ultraviolet rays from the sun. Without it, no living creature would survive. Over the years, man-made chemicals have gradually depleted this shield. The main culprits are chlorofluorocarbons found in refrigeration, foam packaging and spray can propellants. Throughout 1988, scientists argued about the dangers, but towards the end of the year, American research in the frozen wastes of Antarctica showed that the situation could be far more serious than even the most frightening estimates. On the world scene, 88 saw its share of disasters too, with the most spectacular and remarkable 
being air crashes. But the one that claimed the most lives was the fire in the sea. We're going towards it, yes. We're evacuating from a rig that... 147 workers died in the world's worst oil rig disaster. Many others were badly burned, plucked from the freezing waters of the North Sea only minutes after the explosion. They told of alarms on board the Piper Alpha platform signalling a gas leak, followed seconds later by the blast that ripped the rig in two, sending up a ball of flame which was visible for 60 kilometres. The survivors were taken to the sick bay of the nearby Pharos platform for emergency treatment. The talk there was of men trapped in cabins and terrifying blind panic. The fire was extinguished weeks later by the renowned Red Adair. An investigation indicated human error was to blame. In West Germany, the world's worst air show disaster. Three hundred thousand people watched an Italian acrobatic team perform a stunt that went horribly wrong. Forty-seven people, including three pilots, were killed in the fireball. At another air show, a French Airbus dropped from the sky, carrying more than a hundred passengers. Three people were killed and 50 injured. Amazingly, most walked away unscathed from a plane which had virtually disintegrated. But the most extraordinary tale was told by the passengers of this Boeing 737. The plane literally lost its roof when it hit turbulence at 20,000 feet. An air steward was sucked to his death, but the rest of the passengers managed to stay strapped in until the pilot brought it down. Frightening scenes. But there was also good news this year. Kay Cotty entered the history books as the first woman to circumnavigate the world single-handed without touching land. A monumental feat. The Chamberlains were finally pronounced innocent after eight long years. And two of our worst criminals were recaptured. Good news for us, perhaps not so good for them. And then there was the story of the tiny toddler who went missing in wild country. The remarkable story of survival unfolded at Cooktown in Australia's north. Three-year-old Eric Taylor wandered off from his parents' ramshackle house into the nearby national park and disappeared. He was wearing only a singlet and a disposable nappy. State emergency services and local bushmen set up a huge search, but the area was rife with dingoes and feral pigs, and hopes of finding young Eric alive were slim. Yet four days later, the youngster was discovered with barely a scratch. He had both hands on a tree, and he was looking towards us, and he was um, shocked to see us, I, th I think, because it's just the look on his face. As soon as he got out of the chopper, he's seen me, he's got me around the throat, and he wouldn't let go of me, bro. He's covered in scratches, complete from head to foot, cuts, scratches, bruises. But he soon to see me, he grabbed me and he wouldn't let me go. But besides that, he's in a little bit of shock. But besides that, he's perfectly well. You missed his mum? Yes, very much. He's a good boy. Dave, so, did you ever lose hope? Yes, I did at one stage. I thought he was gone. But I knew he'd come back. Because my mum kept saying he would. It is a real miracle. In an historic court ruling this year, Lindy and Michael Chamberlain were cleared over the death of their baby, Azaria. Six years before, Lindy had been stamped a murderer and driven off to serve a life sentence in jail. In 88, they returned to the same court. In an emotional scene, three Northern Territory judges quashed the Chamberlain's convictions. The couple wept openly, and Lindy hugged her lawyer. When they emerged, they were clearly jubilant, but refused to comment. Please say something, Michael. 
Michaels, how do you feel? The decision opened the way for a compensation claim of at least one million dollars. The eight-year battle had been won. While Lindy returned to the ranks of the innocent, an inmate of Goulburn Jail was also free, but on the run. One of Australia's most dangerous prisoners, Raymond John Denning, had escaped for a second time, this time from a minimum security wing. Basically, it is uh, totally unacceptable that a prisoner of the ilk of Denning was accommodated in minimum security facilities anywhere in the prison system. The crack SWAS team was called in, and police took advantage of the truckies blockade being staged at the time to search vehicles. But it was at the Doncaster shopping centre in Melbourne, following a running gun battle with police, that Denning was cornered. He was found in the company of someone the police had long been after, Australia's most wanted man, Russell Mad Dog Cox. Cox had been on the run for 11 years, and police would later accuse him of planning an armed robbery with Denning. But at the time, Denning had his own accusation against the police. Sydney sailor Kay Cotty couldn't have chosen a better name for her 37-foot Cavalier. 1988 saw her become the first lady to circumnavigate the world solo and non-stop. She left the safety of Sydney Harbour in November 1987. Her journey would take her around both capes and into the most dangerous waters in the world. I don't foresee a problem, really. If I did, I wouldn't be attempting it. Any doubts, ever? Do you ever have them? Doubts, well... I guess you think about it because you have to think about the possibilities, what you'd do if you got into that situation. Everything's been built with a view that I will do a 360 degree roll because um, percentages are fairly high that I will do at least one. As luck would have it, she didn't. And after 189 days at sea, Kay Cotty returned home triumphant. Her parents were the first to greet her followed by the entire country. At Sydney's Darling Harbour, the crowds turned out to salute this fabulous feat of courage and determination. And there was a special greeting from Kay's grandmother. In 1988 saw the return to the east coast of Australia in large numbers, that giant of the deep, the whale. The good news is that these monolithic mammals have come back from near extinction and look like becoming a tourist attraction. Oh, I see the whale. It's beside the whale. Trying to have a baby. Trying to have a baby. The relationship between man and these gentle giants seems to be growing closer. This whale dropped into a busy bay to give birth. Perhaps there's hope for our world yet. From one of the largest creatures in the world to one of the rarest and most lovable. In 1988, scientists estimated that there were only 600 pandas left, 
making Feifei and Zhao Zhao very important pandas. To welcome two of the most important visitors ever to come to our shores, Xiao Zhao and Feifei. Wherever they go, these cuddly, lovable creatures are the star attraction. And the merchandising machine that follows them supports the World Wildlife Fund, which is aiming to save them from extinction. It's so difficult to imagine a world without pandas. Let's hope it never happens. Nineteen eighty-eight will long be remembered for its celebrations and its demonstrations. Brisbane's World Expo was a smash hit, which was great as long as you didn't mind queuing. Our new Parliament House, designed to service for the next two hundred years, was officially opened. And then, of course, there were our birthday celebrations, creating some of the most powerful images in our history. On the other side of the coin, and perhaps equally powerful, were the mass demonstrations. Not since the days of the Vietnam moratorium had students taken such a violent stand on any issue. And perhaps it's a sign of the times that this protest was over money. They were protesting against the federal government's decision to introduce a graduate tax, a user pays scheme, where students' incomes would be subject to extra tax once they enter the workforce to recoup some of the costs of their education. All attempts by the Education Minister, Mr Dawkins, to put the government's view were disrupted. And the students made sure the public was aware of their complaints. Following their example, high school students in Sydney took to the streets for the first time in history. There are a lot of people here who will be voting in the next election and we feel that we have something to say and we also feel that you should listen. They were protesting against the policies of the new Liberal Education Minister. He's just taken every student in New South Wales' future in his hands and he doesn't seem really concerned about it, does he? What do we want? Education! Educate men all! What do we want? Education! What do we want? A quieter but more debilitating protest was staged by several thousand truck drivers. It was an awesome sight as the great prime movers banked up bumper to bumper to block the Hume Highway at Yes allowing only a trickle of passenger cars to pass through. The truckies were protesting against what they saw as excessive government charges. There's a lot of workmates of just about each and every one here that have gone bankrupt very recently. There's families out there that are uh, living on less than the poverty line just to keep the truck on the road on, in the hope that things will improve. Truckies around the nation set up smaller blockades, causing chaos on our major arteries. Five days later, the trucks were back on the road, with only a promise of talks to show for their troubles. It was over as quickly as it had started. was the year that saw Brisbane host the World Expo.
crowds were bigger than anyone dared expect. In fact, they numbered almost the entire population of Australia. Much of a visit to Expo was spent in queues, which sometimes lasted up to four hours. But the patrons said it was worth every minute, as there were always so many things happening outside the pavilions. The theme of this Expo was leisure and technology. And according to all accounts, it looks like we're in for some pretty exciting leisure time in the future. The future was also being unveiled in Canberra in 1988 with the opening of our new Parliament House. The arrival of the Queen was upstaged by a last-minute touch-up of the red carpet, but soon the official opening of the billion-dollar building was well and truly underway. I believe the spirit of Sir Robert Menzies would be smiling with approval today. Mr Hawke's reference to the past was followed by the Queen's good wishes for our future. Parliamentary democracy is a compelling ideal, but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed, and it is only too easily destroyed. It is fitting, therefore, and a great pleasure for me to offer my best wishes to all those who will be giving their service to the nation within these walls, and to declare open the new Parliament House of the Commonwealth of Australia. Outside, Her Majesty was met with protest from the Aboriginal community. If the Queen's representative has the power to sack an elected government in 1975, I wouldn't underestimate the power that she's got. We have achieved a lot because we've got a lot of white supporters here with us. Well, if she didn't know about the Aboriginal's qualms before today, well, I hope she thinks about it today. But it seems likely that the Queen, like most of the nation, was thinking of our new Parliament House, which is set to serve all Australians for the next 200 years. At the end of the continuum, 1988 saw the 10th anniversary of Sydney's outrageous gay Mardi Gras. Despite all the fun and frivolity, the spectre of AIDS underlined this event. Although participants handed out free condoms advocating safe sex, the Reverend Fred Nile of the Festival of Light movement has called for an end to what he calls this repulsive display. Only time will tell if his prayer is answered. And that may well be a record of the last gay Mardi Gras. The times are changing. Our birthday celebrations certainly saw scenes that will never be repeated. The First Fleet reenactment was the most spectacular event, perhaps, of the decade. They set out to reenact one of the most gruelling voyages in history, and their own journey would be far from trouble free. This was the People's Fleet. Most of the crewmen were novice trainees who paid to take part in the adventure. In a tragic irony, it was one of the most experienced professional sailors who was lost overboard in high seas. He's been in there six hours now. 
chances are, even if we find it, we're probably dead. But the fleet sailed on into troubled waters of a different kind. By the time they reached Rio, the First Fleet Reenactment Company had run out of money. They turned to the federal government to bail them out. Bail out? No, no. Bailing's a question for sailors, not for prime ministers. But with the financial support of the people of Australia, the ships ran on to a meeting with destiny at Sydney Harbour on Australia Day. What a day for Australia. What a, what a uniting day. Everybody must be proud to be an Australian. We set out, we set out to reenact the voyage of the First Fleet, but we seem to have made history ourselves. I, we, we, we're being greeted like conquering heroes, and that's a very humbling experience. This is like a dream. I mean, really, yeah, there, are, there would be 5,000 boats around us. God's turned on the sunshine. God protected us the whole way across. The oceans let us through. We were blessed. He must have wanted it to happen. And I just think it's just the most wonderful blessing to be an Australian in Australia today. And if this doesn't make us proud and united as a people, then nothing will. I think it's a great start to our birthday party. afternoon, the government-sponsored tall ships sailed out to sea. And a great day saw a spectacular end. Well, Bob Hawke made a brief appearance in that historical event, and uh, in that case, I'm not entirely sure he was too popular. But of the main players in the political game in 88, the Prime Minister was well out in front. In one popularity poll, he rated 53%, while his opponent, John Howard, scored minus 20. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they worked that out, but it was an indication of the way things were going. The political issue of the year was immigration. Are we destroying the harmony of our community by allowing in too many Asians? The main players in the political game in 88 were the very popular Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, the very shaky leader of the opposition, John Howard, the boots and all leader of the National Party, Ian Sinclair, and the Federal Treasurer and heir apparent to the top job, Paul Keating. But the Prime Minister chose to put Mr Keating in his place, 
making it clear that Bob Hawke gives up his post of six years only when he's good and ready. As you say, it has been six years and I look forward to the next six. <laughs> now, uh, it's good news for some, not so good for others, perhaps. Mr Keating publicly asserted that he'd stay on as treasurer, but it was understood that privately he was furious. Unlike other years, he kept a low post-budget profile, refusing the usual round of interviews. Do you feel you've been a bit cheated? I'm not saying anything about that now. Come on, gang. Meanwhile, Mr Minus 20% faced ongoing rumours of challenges from his deputy, Andrew Peacock. And all the polls indicated that Mr Peacock was the preferred Liberal leader. But polls can be deceptive. They indicated that Australians wanted less Asian immigration. But when John Howard made that Liberal policy, the screams of protest were heard all the way to Hong Kong. And Honest John did a quick about-face. The objective of the policy to ensure that um, if at any time in the future a coalition government would seek in the interests of social harmony to take steps that alter the flow of people from any part of the world, that that will be fully within the terms of the policy. I feel such a degree of abhorrence about what he has done and the unleashing of uh, forces which just shouldn't be unleashed that I, I find it difficult uh, to, uh, to actually think about him uh, on this issue. Ian Sinclair, as usual, didn't beat around the bush. There were too many Asians coming into Australia in proportion to migrants from other countries. And Senator John Stone supported his leader. And what some of us have been calling for is some slowing down in that development. For his trouble, he was dropped by John Howard from the front bench. I'm inclined to think that, uh, on balance, Mr Howard yesterday may have done me a favour. John Howard, on the other hand, survived the furor that he'd created, but he remained on very shaky ground as a leader. But there was a passing parade of familiar faces in Canberra in 88. The Special Minister of State, Mick Young, was the first to go. His demise was sparked by the Harris Dice Shower scandal concerning the misuse of funds for election purposes. But it was the way the media handled the story that was the final straw for the one-time Shearer. You know, I put up with a fair battering which rather ignores, you know, 30 years in public life and things you might have achieved or accomplished or participated in. Mick Young had had enough of politics and threw in the towel. The Minister for Sports, Tourism and Good Times, John Brown, also resigned after he was found to have misled Parliament over the tender for the Australian Pavilion at Expo. And he too decided that the media was to blame for his predicament. And his publicist's wife, Jan Murray, fully agreed. Typical of the Australian media, bumble-footed. Another heavyweight to resign was the controversial and colourful Queensland Minister, Russ Hins. Hins had been in the political arena for 22 years and always saw himself as a contender for the Premier's job. But after Ahern took that job from Bjorki Peterson, Hins was forced out of the ministry when he was mentioned in the Fitzgerald inquiry. He soon retired to become a thorn in the side of the new Premier. Faces were changing in New South Wales as well, with the Unsworth government meeting its Waterloo. I've come here on behalf of the government to concede defeat. Composed inside, Mr Unsworth's frustrations finally showed as he left. Hello, Hello. It's nice to see an old fellow like you get ahead. And, and this one, it's the old Lipstone Council. That's one you it was the news Nick Greiner had been waiting to hear. Well, I feel elated. I'm, I'm happy about it, obviously. It's a, it's a great result, it's great spirit, and it's only the beginning. But perhaps the best-known face to leave politics in 88 was Foreign Affairs Minister Bill Hayden. His departure, like his career, wasn't without controversy. Hayden, a confirmed Republican, was leaving to become the new Governor-General of Australia. Ian Sinclair, for one, made it clear that he didn't think Hayden or his wife Dallas was fit for the job. I wouldn't pretend it wasn't hurtful, uh, but uh, I don't wish to engage in some sort of caterwauling, undignified exchange. Sinclair followed the fashion of blaming the media 
and then went on to say it all again. Well, I think that the media has hyped up everything that I've said. I repeat that I am concerned that the role of the Governor-General, which is not just the one person, it's the two, should be above criticism, should be in a status which is going to be accepted universally throughout the community and there'll be no controversy. But in spite of that, the announcement came. Bill Hayden was farewelled by friends and the media alike. But did he have one regret? It would have been great to have been Prime Minister. There's no greater honour in public life in this country than to be Prime Minister of this country. It's uh, a position of, uh, of great trust and an opportunity to do many things. But that would never be for Bill Hayden. And the man responsible for ensuring that he never had the chance just went on from strength to strength in 88. In the world of politics, it was definitely Bob Hawke's year. So the urbane but uh, casual Bill Hayden became our new Governor General, swearing that he'd wear no top hat and leave the Rolls Royce at home. But I can't help wondering if he was just a touch out of step with the majority of Australians. It seems that in 88, we still enjoyed a little ceremony. Every member of the royal family visited our shores this year, and we turned out in droves to welcome them. First to arrive in our bicentennial year were Prince Charles and Princess Diana, who were greeted by an enthusiastic crowd in Sydney. Charles and Diana came to join our birthday celebrations. After all, Charles had happy memories of his school days in Victoria. While I was here, I had the pommy bits bashed off me, <laughs> like chips off an old block, and the results are really too obvious. A few days later, the royal couple went north to the seaside resort of Terrigal, where the princess made a cheeky entrance. The royal parade down the beach got momentarily bogged down, and then it was Beauty and the Beasts as Di coyly joined the local lifesavers for a snap. Later, Charles flew to Kerry Packer's property at Scone for a round of polo and showed that the genteel prince doesn't mind joining in the rough and tumble. He plays it as rugged as anyone else, but it still are some limitations to what, he, what he's allowed to do and what he can do. And while Charles was doing what he loves best, so was Princess Di, who visited the Bernardo's Centre at Auburn in Sydney. Diana is the royal president of Bernardo's in Australia. The couple's last stop was the Northern Territory, where they came face to face with one of Australia's savage man-eaters. Then it was farewell bouquets before Charles and Diana left for their next engagement in Bangkok. But it wasn't long before another member of the royal family was on our shores. Princess Anne spent much of her visit indulging her love of horses at the Royal Easter Show. The Queen came here to celebrate our birthday along with her own. All went well on her Melbourne tour until she boarded the old Sydney ferry, the South Stain, for a state reception. It was expected to be a comfortable trip to the Melbourne suburb of Williamstown in spite of strong winds. 
But as the ferry headed off, it was clear a collision was imminent. The winds blew the steamship onto a 12-metre boat moored at the wharf, which had to be towed away after it began taking on water. The Queen appeared less than perturbed. The next day, Her Royal Highness met the people of Melbourne. I've waited 42 years for this. Then it was on to Canberra for the main purpose of her visit, the opening of our new Parliament House. But back home, the high-class house of ill repute at 67 Wigmore Street was becoming the centre of a royal scandal. Sarah Ferguson's father had been linked with a prostitute. Occasionally we saw a few respectable looking businessmen go in or come out, but we had no idea of what activities. We knew it was a so-called health club. 26-year-old prostitute Barbara Ashley claimed Major Ferguson was one of her better clients. Unfortunately, his photograph has been taken coming out or going in, I don't know which it is. So there's no point in his denying it, um, because there he is in black and white. Daughter Sarah was warned by Buckingham Palace to steer clear of her father. But fortunately for all concerned, the incident was soon overshadowed by the happy news of an addition to the royal family. <laughs> Princess Beatrice was born on the 8th of the 8th, 88 which, according to the Chinese, is the luckiest day of the decade. And at the other end of the dynasty, the ever-popular Queen Mother turned 88 in 1988. She celebrated her birthday with three generations of Windsors. The last to arrive down under were the Duke and Duchess of York. Fergie, as she's affectionately known, arrived five days early on a commercial Qantas flight. The decision to leave her new baby behind caused considerable controversy. <laughs> Prince Andrew flew in from his ship by Navy helicopter. He met with Australian Army and Navy officials before joining his wife. Their official visit began in Canberra, where the royal couple were greeted by the Governor-General and the Prime Minister, and everyone inquired after the baby. Very well. Oh, yes, very well. Later, at a display of computer wear, Sarah caught a cadet drawing blotchy marks on an image of her face. What did you do? Do it again, do it again. <laughs> Tackle. In our next segment, we highlight trends and fashions, and just a few of the more oddball stories that made the news. But first up, that family institution in Oz, the Holden Car. For the first time in 40 years, we saw an all-new Holden, every nut and bolt. Five years in the planning, and born out of desperation, the first all-new Holden car for 40 years, the VN Commodore range. The General had slipped to a poor second place in market share. If this car didn't work, it could be the end of the line for the Holden. But they were giving it their best shot. With a big fuel-injected V6, four-speed automatic and overdrive, and the largest interior space ever, the motoring critics loved it. This was the race of the all-Australian family car. All that remained was to await the public's response. But the new Commodore was up against some very stiff competition. The latest Ford Falcon had also been five years on the drawing board. But Ford had managed to get their new model out six months ahead of Holden's. The response had been dramatic and looked like keeping Ford at number one position until the arrival of the General's answer. The two cars were surprisingly similar in appearance and specifications. The pundits called it a dead heat. 
Only time would tell if the average Australian family agreed. Another race in the technology stakes began again in earnest in 1988. Three years after the Challenger tragedy and the loss of seven astronauts, NASA successfully relaunched the Space Shuttle. flowed freely as America's pride was restored. But the three-year wait for this joyous event had put the US well behind the Soviets in the space race. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, a brand new $10 note was to line our pockets this year. It was supposed to be the most secure form of currency in the world due to a revolutionary design. But it was soon discovered this could wear away. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's a waste of money, then, isn't it? Scratch and match money. <laughs> With a little use, the hologram of Captain Cook was easily rubbed off. The plastic money is now a collector's item. And that wasn't the only tender to burn a hole in the Reserve Bank's pocket in 88. The new $2 coin proved more durable, but equally unpopular with the public. It's awful. It's, um, it, it's too small and um, I keep on losing it. I think it's totally devalued, the $2 note. Most ladies just think they're two cent coins and we sometimes don't check them. We just throw them in the till and take it as two cents where sometimes we, it seems like we're ripping them off. But... All it does for me is put more holes in my pockets. I think it'll work out all right in the long run. It's a matter of getting used to it. But in spite of the protests, the old $2 note was gone. And time would tell whether the new coin would become an accepted fact of Australian life. I thought you might like a record of what the fashionable woman was wearing in 88. This is the colourful spring collection. And the outstanding fashion trend this year was the return to soft and feminine underwear. Certainly a sign of the times in 88 was the opening of the world's first condom bar. Virgin Records decided to sell safe sex as well as the latest LPs and soon found they had a hit on their hands. For the first time that I can remember since I've been involved in the, in, in the, AIDS, in the AIDS fight, the doctors and scientists are now beginning to say that we may, we may never, that we, that we do run a risk of losing the fight against AIDS. You have any facilities for testing? I'm the most extraordinary story of the year would have to be the close encounter of one West Australian family. While driving across the Nullarbor, the Knolls say their family sedan was attacked by a spaceship. It was chasing us and it all of a sudden it landed on our car, pulled our car back and 
I'd put my hand at the window and I'd, I fell on the roof. It was like a um, sponge on the roof. It was sucking the roof, you know, the car. It was a sponge. It was sort of shaped like that, and on the outsides it was like that, and in the centre it was like that. And I asked me Beretta, you know, if that was a spaceship, and he goes, don't be stupid. So I got up closer to have a look, and it was moving backwards and forwards. And so we decide to take off to have a look. We decide to take off. I went down my window, and all this smoke started coming. It was like a greyish black mist. And that's when our voices started to change. All of us, our voices just went really deep and strange. And we found like we felt like we were dying. Sean, you were driving. How fast did you get up to? I got up to about 200 kilometres. That's very fast. Have you driven that fast before? Uh, no, I haven't. I got a blowout, and once the car stopped, I blinked out, and I don't know what happened after that. Strange marks were found on the roof of the car, but as for little green men, well, we'll leave that up to you. And that wasn't the only remarkable encounter this year. This monster from the deep was hauled in off Nelson Bay in New South Wales. Tipping 472 kilograms, it was just five kilograms lighter than the 20-year-old world record set by Bob Dyer. It was caught by 15-year-old Stephen Cole Reavy. Didn't know it was going to be a white. We thought it'd be something else, but it came up to be a white. Thought it was a whaler at first. The whale was just swimming on the bottom of the ocean. The battle against the creature wasn't easy. It took more than four hours of back-breaking effort to haul the shark in. But that hasn't put Stephen off from having another crack. I wouldn't mind getting another one. Sharks beware. And from one monster to another, meet Betty, all 1.8 kilograms of her. This is a spectacular creature. It's huge, it's monstrous, and it's from Queensland. And it took a lot of work to get Betty to this condition. Worm tablets, supplies of beetles, rats and mice. And despite huge American contenders like Jabber the Toad and Totally Awesome, Glenn says a global record is within his reach. However... It takes an enormous amount of feeding, and when you've got such a big animal, it takes an enormous amount of cleaning. Well, the, uh, the toad was good, but uh, I thought the family who saw the UFO was the best. At the head of our program, we looked at the Australian entertainers who made it big this year. But there was also a wide range of international stars who came here, and they all had something to say. Let's have a look at that, and then we have an Australian who almost made the international scene. I think you'll recognise him. But first, here's the big stars from the world stage. Sylvester Stallone on why he walks the streets of cities he visits. You really get the feel of a town, you have to get out there. I mean, somehow reality loses something with room service. John Cougar Mellencamp on the boredom of touring. Hell, I'm bored all the time. <laughs> I'm always bored. I'm bored all the time. You know? I, but that's what keeps me riding, you know. Yeah. Keeps me searching, you know. Keeps me changing. That's what you... We gotta keep changing. We gotta keep looking. Olivia Newton-John on making it big in Australia. I was with Kylie Minogue the other day in London and we were on a television show together and I said, you know, it's really, she's a really lucky girl because when I was starting out in Australia, you had to leave to have success. You couldn't have a success, a major success from Australia. You could have local success, but if you wanted to make it in records or in film, you had to leave. ACDC's Angus on getting older. Well, I've always been pretty fast. You know, I've never liked to, I mean, as far as what I do for a living, I've always liked things quick, you know? And uh, I don't think, no, I, it hasn't really slowed me down. Mick Jagger on Australia's image overseas. The perception of Australia from outside is, is changed by kind of things that perhaps you don't like, you know? Because <laughs> it's still, it's, it's taken, and I saw Crocodile Dundee and all that. It's, not really atypical of Australia, but that's, especially from America, is what people think of it. I don't think America's really thought about Australia before then very much. And Stallone on Crocodile Dundee's Paul Hogan. That's good, you know, I mean, he's, uh, 
One of the favorite sons here, and you guys should be pretty proud of him. Robin Williams on politics in the United States. We have some really fun stuff going on right now. We have uh, Ed Meese. Ed Meese in charge of the Justice Commission. Hey, what happened? A lot of people, you know, interesting stuff. Ollie North, um, pardon me, Mr. North, will you answer the questions? No? You know, fun stuff. <laughs> Gordon Liddy sitting at home going, damn, if I had a uniform. Fun stuff like that, a lot of interesting things. There's Ron going, I don't know what happened. I'm just hanging out, basically, and Nancy's dubbing my voice. James Brown on how he enjoys fame. I love being a celebrity, yes. Uh, a star, sometimes they go out very quick, but being a celebrity, you, you live on and on, so I prefer being a celebrity. Leo Sayer on how his life has changed. I remember the first time I was here, there were, there were all these kind of crazy, crazy events. I used to look out the window and find young girls scaling the walls and things like that. It was great. I'm, I, I can't say it wasn't great, but it's, life's a little bit more sort of you know, steady now, you know. And the monkeys on their heyday in the 60s. I don't remember much what happened back then, to be honest. They say that if you can remember the 60s, you weren't really there. Well, we started out as two actors and two musicians, and we became um, four each. Four actors and four musicians. In fact, there's 16 of us, even as we speak. <laughs> in excess on the music that's taken them to the top. It's instant music, it's instant lyrics. It doesn't have to rely on culture so much, and it doesn't have to rely on tradition so much. You're allowed to change the rules. And cranky Frank Sinatra on his return. You're happy to be back in Australia? Yes, sir. Do you have any bad memories of Australia at all? Nope. You glad you've been getting fan letters over the years? Yep. You're saying this is the ultimate concert. No, is it going to be that good? No. Why don't you come and see? Yeah. He became known here in Australia as the wildly extroverted Aussie rules player. But it was as the supercharged battery salesman that America first met our very own Jacko. His loud, brash and brazen personality seemed to be right at home in the US and they cast him alongside Sam Jones, of Flash Gordon fame, in the NBC primetime series The Highwayman. Sam's the star, right? There he is there, that's Sam the star, but of course, then he got Jacko, right? Now, Hollywood weren't ready for me, but here I am. I've knocked on the door, they let me in. I sat in the boss's chair, told him a couple of dirty jokes, and I was in like Flint. Beautiful. Background. And action. You parked that rinky-dink little vehicle in my super-powered truck's place? Wow! You left your lights on. <laughs> but the joke may well have been on Jacko. After claiming he was getting a salary of a cool $7 million, the series was axed. This is Hollywood, baby. <laughs> yes, well, I guess it is. They say there are no second chances in Hollywood, but who knows? Maybe Jacko will break that rule too. In the meantime, he came back to this country to play Aussie Rules, and we'll have a little of that for you in a moment. We weren't able to bring you all the big fixtures in sport this year. We'd have needed a separate tape. But there were a number of events which stood out from the rest for a variety of reasons. One of those was, of course, the Olympic Games. And the hero there was a young swimmer called Duncan Armstrong. Armstrong won gold and broke the world record in a 200 metres freestyle that featured the world's finest. I didn't really take notice, I just beat whoever was in my heat. And I made the final and then I just beat whoever was in the final. And just having to be three world record holders, that's all. And I said to everyone last four years ago, the kids back home, start training because... And you kids back home, start again because if you're prepared to do it, it shows you what a battle it can do, an Aussie battle. Coach Laurie Lawrence had every reason to be over the moon, especially considering the three world record holders his boy had beaten. And he beat them all! <laughs> and what's, what happens there? He gonna... beat them all! All of them! Phew! Next up, in a photo finish, Debbie Flintoff King stole the 400 metres hurdles. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Congratulations. Debbie's sister had died two days before our team left Australia. 
But her father promised that the family would bind her up with love, that she'd come through. Husband Phil King was the trainer behind the champion. It's been a hard slog. It's worth it. Flintoff King won by one hundredth of a second and Australia had its first gold medal on the track in 20 years. I don't think anyone really, unless they've won a gold medal themselves, they don't think they realise how much work that they do put in it. Our third gold went to the women's hockey team, the first hockey gold in our history. It's uh, the best feeling in the world. It's just great, absolutely great. We took 14 medals in all and considering the number of countries fielding teams, it was a result to be proud of. But in a day of shame, Australian pentathlete Alex Watson was banished from the Olympic Games after testing positive for caffeine. I would have come home, I believe, a, a hero. Now I've come home accused of being a cheat, so I'm not very happy and I'm, I'm going to fight. Watson claimed that a Romanian official had spiked his water bottle. The Olympics Committee promised a full inquiry. And then the disclosure that Ben Johnson, the fastest man on earth, had used steroids. He was followed by a number of others, sent home in disgrace. In fact, the Games of 88 may well be remembered as the Drug Olympics. 88 was the year that the Marrickville mauler, Jeff Fennec, became the first Australian in history to win three world titles. The third was won from Victor Calea of Argentina in a fight that promised much and delivered. Due to an injury, Fennec was mainly confined to fighting with his left hand. But in spite of that, in the 10th round, the American referee had no alternative but to step in. And maybe the ref had taken one or two in the clinches because he didn't seem to know where he was either. This was a great fight and I appreciate you having me here in Argentina. One of the most controversial sporting events of the year was the bicentennial around Australia yacht race. The 21 competing yachts knew they were in for a torrid time even before the starter's gun. The Melbourne Trimaran Escapade was the first to falter. It capsized in 55 knot winds and 7 metre waves. A police launch was sent to the rescue, but she too was swallowed by the huge seas. Three policemen were plucked from their life raft, and ambulances carried the shaken trio to hospital but their $300,000 boat was at the bottom of the ocean. And the drama wasn't over. Boundary Rider, an 11-metre sloop from Queensland, ran aground, rolled and was dismasted, throwing 39-year-old Jeff Curtis overboard. An extensive search failed to find him, leading to this outburst from the Assistant Police Commissioner. How many more do we need to be killed and lose their lives so that foolhardy people can go ahead with races around Australia in the middle of winter, August, where it is known that there are always huge winds and big seas. But the race organisers strongly refuted accusations of recklessness and defended the right of the individual to take calculated risks in a sporting event. The race was completed without further misadventure. The Clayton's event of the year was the America's Cup, which saw a giant catamaran competing against an even bigger monohull. And the Americans whipped the New Zealanders both on and off the water. If that is the best that Dennis can do, then uh, I think it's a disappointment for him to be defending in the America's Cup, because I feel the boat could have gone a lot better than what it did. Can you answer that, Dennis? No, I guess when he's won uh, four America's Cup, uh, he can uh, then tell me how to do it. <laughs> I think we would have had much more respect for our opposition if they had sailed it to its full potential and we had been beaten by an hour and a half rather than 18 minutes. I'm sailing a cat. <laughs> Somebody else is sailing a dog. <laughs> Greek superman Yanis Kouros this year beat all comers and the handicapper to win his second straight Sydney to Melbourne ultra marathon. After starting 12 hours behind the rest of the field, Kouros soon caught the early leader Dick Tunk from New Zealand and finished in five days and 17 hours. Many of the other runners suffered from the 30 degree heat throughout the race. Warm in Australia. This, this weather is uh, for me. 
Very difficult today. Yanis Kuros arrived at the Doncaster shopping town, the winner by 25 kilometers. The biggest and most colourful sporting event on the Australian calendar is undoubtedly the VFL Grand Final. It's a religion in Melbourne. It attracts audiences from all corners of our country and it's seen by 40 million people around the world. This year saw the Demons Melbourne run onto the MCG for the first time in 24 years. They were up against the more experienced Hawthorne, who took an early lead. Grand final nerves erupted on the field a few times, and the crowd cheered a behind when a streaker took to the field. But the game was all Hawthorne's way. They demolished the Demons, 22 goals 20 to 6 goals 20. Just imagine finally getting to the big game and going down like that, eh? So, that was our year, 1988. Like I said at the beginning, a crazy mosaic, full of contradictions. I wonder how history will judge our bicentenary. How successful were our birthday celebrations? Did they draw the country together or mark the beginning of racial tensions that will tear us apart? Can we look forward to a period of great prosperity or the devastating consequences of the greenhouse effect? You'll know the answer in a decade or two when you find this tape in a dusty corner of the attic and plug in that big old box called a video recorder. But before I go, there were three very special people who left us in 88, and we thought it important to bid them farewell. They deserve to be remembered. And I'll see you next year for 1989, the year on video. He was the man who changed yachting history. A hero enjoying the adulation of our entire nation. But the pressures of success took their toll. And after the big race, Ben Lexon was showing the signs of stress. A mild heart attack put him in hospital for a week. A year later, he was dead. One of many who would deeply mourn his loss was Australia 2 skipper John Bertrand. We've gone through a lot of highs and a lot of lows together. Uh, <laughs> it goes back a long way. Ben is part of our national culture, was and will continue to be forevermore as a result of his uh, contribution that he made. Remember in 1983, the economy was pretty grey and people's self-image in this country was pretty lacklustre from what I remember of the uh, period, and when we were able to win against almost impossible odds with Australia too, that was the spark that this country needed. And Ben was very instrumental in that, of course. When we won the cup, I thought this was going to be a monkey got off my back or some sort of uh, relief, but it's not. There's, uh, it was for a little bit of time, and then there was a period of chaos, and now things are starting to fall into place, and now there's this frantic uh, worry that maybe we, we can't defend it, we must defend it. First impressions of the physically powerful, highly emotional, sometimes out of control character, slowly changed as I came to understand the sensitive, loving, comical, but always sincere. <laughs> person that was Ben. William McMahon entered federal parliament in 1949 with the first Menzies government. He became the treasurer, but was passed over in favor of Harold Holt when Menzies stepped down in 1966. The disappearance of Prime Minister Holt in a swimming accident a year later provoked a crisis for the liberal leadership. 
McMahon made a run for the top job, but was blocked by the country party, and John Gorton was elected. But Gorton himself lost the confidence of his party, and in 1971 was replaced by McMahon. We've had in our international life, they're the goals that we want to sustain in the future. Billy McMahon's commitment to politics may have accounted for the fact that he married late in life, but he was a devoted father and husband, and stuck by his wife Sonia through the international storm stirred up by that dress. In fact, his visit to the White House was a great success, but the government that McMahon had inherited was tired and dispirited. The war in Vietnam and growing hostility to conscription triggered the success of Gough Whitlam in 1972. The McMahon government had lasted only 20 months. Sir William stayed on in Parliament for another decade, but in retirement his health suffered and he died just six years later. He epitomised that much overused cliché of the nicest guy in the business. Ricky May was the nicest guy in the business. He was uh, bigger than himself. His heart was bigger than he was. Uh, I loved him. I think it's, it's, you don't say that about a man very often, but I, I love Ricky May. Ricky was the sort of person who did enjoy them himself, and it, maybe that contributed to his early death, but I, I don't know. I mean, he gave so much pleasure to so many people, it's, it's hard to say, you know, how could you take a meal away from the guy and say, OK, you know, back to bed and just be a good boy. So what is that? Is that lunch? Is that what, that's afternoon? That's your two o'clock juice. That's my two o'clock juice. Yeah, that's your bodybuilder. Bodybuilder. Boy, okay. can I talk to you about that? He was a one-off. There'll never be another Ricky May. Once again, an old cliche, but it's so true in his case. Stray of your bones. Stray of your tongue. Watching to see what's going down I was born in a beautiful place born into a beautiful race and it seemed so strong